when I listened to Eliezer and to Duncan and Caroline and I see my friends Jaden and Jean-Marie and Layman and Philip and others, it gives me such tremendous confidence in what the Lord is doing here. Let's pray. Be our teacher as we touch on sacred topics. Open our minds and hearts, we pray. Amen. Hatched, matched, dispatched. That's the schoolboy essay summarising life. Hatched, matched, dispatched. Somewhat more cultured from a famous poet of the 21st century. Birth, copulation and death, that's all the facts when it comes to brass tacks. Birth, copulation and death. But not just writers of doggerel, <coughs> but the most famous writers of all time have riveted our attention on this fearful subject because it is death that gives value to life. Have you ever thought about it? If there was no death and you and I were now immortal, a few mistakes wouldn't matter. But in view of the fact that we're going to die, that one day your name or mine or both will be in the obituary. That's what gives life its sacred and solemn importance. Decisions matter. Everything we do. Scottish theologian John Bailey said, the most solemn thing about life is that nothing lasts. How soon the bloom disappears from all that's young. How brief is the vigour of maturity. And old age brings weariness, <coughs> forgetfulness and decay which intimate the coming oblivion and corruption of the grave. Perhaps the most famous psychologist of all time was William James. <coughs> he said, all natural goods perish, riches take wings, fame is a breath, love is a cheat. Can things whose end is always dust and disappointment be the real things our souls require? We need a life not correlated with death. We need a kind of good that won't perish, a good that flies beyond the goods of nature. Now someone of an entirely different stamp that you have heard of, Tennessee Williams, when he died, surrounded by half-filled gin bottles and bottles of pills about himself, Tennessee Williams said, I am a definition of hysteria. First thing of the day, I take get-up pills. Last thing of the day, I take get-to-sleep pills. I am a definition of hysteria. Perhaps his greatest play <coughs> was Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And the heart of that play pictures Big Daddy, a southern patriarch, multi-billionaire, owns 28,000 acres, but is just being diagnosed with fatal cancer. And he's down in the underground of their huge palace surrounded by all sorts of frippery, expensive frippery, and his son Brick comes down. What are you doing, Dad? This is all the stuff your mother has bought. Whatever country we visited in Europe, your mother bought and bought and bought. Shop till she dropped. Buy till she dies. Funny, said Brick. 
we buy things subconsciously hoping one day we'll buy everlasting life. But we don't have the advantage of the pig. The advantage of the pig. Dad, what are you talking about? Well, a pig doesn't know about death. But we do. We do. A very old book asks the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? <coughs> if he doesn't, life is meaningless. Death just becomes a sacrament of sin. Of course, there are lots of people that hope man won't live again. Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Sherman Mao, between them, responsible for over a hundred million deaths. They don't want to live again. Not the judgment day that Eliezer showed us about. So they have a monument. Don't bother me now. Don't bother me never. I want to be dead forever and ever. But what are their chances? Same book of Job. Let me read to you from the 19th chapter. <coughs> this is one of the oldest books in the world, dealing with the oldest problem in the world, the sacrament of sin, death. I'm in Job 19. And I'm looking at verse 25. I know that my Redeemer lives, that in the end he'll stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. I know that my Redeemer lives and that I shall see him. Stalin doesn't want to see him. Everyone who's lived selfishly, meanly, greedily, impurely, avariciously, they don't want to see him. There was a famous play many, many years ago called Outward Bound. It was turned into a movie. <coughs> Pictured a huge liner, many, many people on board, but after they've been some days at sea, Everybody on board becomes aware of two things. They don't remember booking a passage. And they don't know where the ship is going to. They've been told that when they get to the port, an examiner will come on board and allocate whether they go to the left or to the right. And slowly they begin to remember. They realise they're dead. And their conscience tells them of things in their life of which they're very much ashamed when they've taken unfair advantage, when they've been mean, when they've deceived, when they've been selfish. And they're afraid of the examiner coming. You know, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians that says, the sting of death is sin. The greatest anguish in the world for unbelievers is the thought of the inevitability of death, its certainty and the uncertainty of what happens next. For the natural man, death is a terrible battle and no victory at last. It's a tempestuous sea with no harbour at last. It's a slippery height with no footing. It's a desperate fall with no bottom. Death, the sacrament of sin. The Jewish psychiatrist Sigmund Freud said the most painful riddle in the world is death. It's never been solved and it never will be solved. If he's right, life is only a zero 
for whatever ends in a zero is itself a zero. We measure the worth of something by its continuity. When you get married, you don't say, this is going to be a wonderful honeymoon. You say, this is forever. We measure the value of things by how they last, by whether they endure. But if death is the end, everything's a zero. If we are the product of matter plus time plus chance, nothing has value. Nothing's worth living for and certainly nothing's worth dying for. You all know the author of Jungle Tales and the Kim stories, Rudyard Kipling. He was taking a graduation lecture at McGill University and he warned the graduates, don't be sucked in too much by desire for power, money or fame because one day you'll meet someone who doesn't care a fig for all those things and then you'll know how poor you are. Well, that man has come and he died for us and he burst the barriers of the tomb and he lives and because he lives, all who believe in him will live forever. A soldier on the border of battle asked the chaplain, what happens after death? He lit a match. Watch it go out. Is that it? What would Jesus have told him? He would have said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. For I am the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's what Jesus would have said. What are his credentials? Can we really trust those high, polluting ideas? None of us have that long. You know, when you're five, the time to the next Christmas is a fifth of a lifetime. When you're 50, the time to the next Christmas is only a 50th of a lifetime. Now time is going 10 times as fast. What about when you get to 80? Life's a candle. We've only got one candle and it burns. When it's through, we're through. Life flees. So what are the credentials? of the man that claimed to be the resurrection and the life. He is the only man who's ever lived who claimed to be God, who was thought sane by his wisest contemporaries. Ever thought about that? Any other man that claims to be God, we have him put, him, put away quite quickly. He is the only man who ever lived who claimed to be God and was thought sane by his wisest contemporaries. He pointed one day to the sun and said, I am the light of the world. He said, all power in heaven and in earth is given unto me. He even claimed that the angels were his. When the Son of Man comes with his angels, they all belong to him. The Nazarene carpenter the penniless rabbi, all the angels are his. He said we should love him more than father or mother. He said we should love him more than life. He said he was the saviour of the world. He said he was the judge of the world. He said he came to die for the sins of the world. Look at him on the cross. He's as calm as though he's on a summer pavement as he bestows paradise on one man and gives his best friend to his mother and intercedes for his crucifiers. 
Could one flaw be found in the fourfold narrative about Jesus of Nazareth, the balloon would burst. But there's not even one flaw. The most natural explanation for Jesus is the supernatural. If he was altogether good, he was altogether God. Good men know about the problems in their hearts and minds, but he never knew guilt. He prayed for others, he never prayed with others. And after his death came a revolution that changed the world and the waves of that tide are still sweeping across till one in every three people on the globe claim they believe in the crucified Son of God. You can explain a puddle in the road by talking about a shower. You can't explain the Gulf Stream that way. Here were broken-hearted men and women, suddenly changed, as if convulsed, and now they fear nothing, not even the lions of Caesar's amphitheatres. Altogether changed. And you know there's a verse that most people skip over. Would you look with me at 1 Corinthians, please? Verse 15, verse 6. He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the time, at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. What is Paul saying? He is saying hundreds of people, when he wrote that, were still alive who had seen the resurrected Christ. Hundreds of people still alive. As you know, the records of the resurrection are so honest. One occasion where he says he appeared to many people, it puts in a phrase I wouldn't have put in if I was trying to win people to a new faith. It says he appeared to many and some doubted. You only say that if it's a true record. You'd never put that into a fable. And some doubted. Hundreds still alive when Paul wrote this. Of course, people had every reason to believe. In the book of Isaiah, written hundreds of years before Christ, <coughs> 53rd chapter spoke about a man who'd be despised and rejected of men, who'd be brought as a lamb to the slaughter, who'd carry our griefs and our sorrows, who would be cut off and yet prolong his days. Hey, how can you be cut off and prolong your days? And his posterity shall serve him. And then in Psalm 22, the first 20 verses or so, you have a series of sobs in the Hebrew, series of sobs, beginning, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then in the second half of Psalm 22, the sobs cease and all is glory, all is wonderful. Now there's a wonderful feast and even the rich and the powerful of earth are bowing down to partake of this feast. And it says, all men shall bow before him because no one can keep alive his own soul. And they shall tell this to the world. He'll go to the world. That he has done this, or it could be translated that he has finished, begins with the words of the cross, my God, my God, why? Ends with the words of the cross. It's done. It's done. It's finished. And then there were the types. I wonder if you've noticed in this same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, he's raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Hey, Paul, what scriptures are you talking about? He only ever used that term for the Old Testament, not yet given to the New Testament. On the first work of God, the th First chapter of Genesis, on the third day, the earth came up in resurrection out of the waters. Isaac, on the third day, after being sentenced to death, is delivered as in resurrection from the altar of death. On the third day of every year, third day after the Passover, the first sheaf was reaped, the pledge of a huge harvest to follow. On the third day they reaped it. 
when there was rebellion in the camp, people claiming to be priests and leaders and their rods were put in the sanctuary. After a period of darkness, they're all looked at and only Aaron's rod is budding with flowers after the time of darkness. When they crossed the Jordan River, stones were taken out of that river, planted on the earth, out of the river of death, new life on earth. Jonah is raised on the third day. Yes, it's true, he was raised according to the scriptures on the third day. I want you to notice the verse in chapter 19 of John. It's too often passed by of tremendous importance, John 19, and we're going to look at verse 41. Here it tells us that in the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and they placed his body in that garment. That's verse 41 of chapter 19. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb. (coughs) A garden is a symbol of life and death. A garden is where seeds, buried, dead, spring forth into new life. Flowers fade, but seeds spring up in resurrection. Garden is a symbol of resurrection. All nature tells the same story. (coughs) We love to watch the birds. Willie Wagtail. So active. He was once just a liquid mass in his mother's womb. Now he can soar into the heavens. That's true of every bird. They were once just a liquid mass, hidden in darkness. But they emerged from darkness with power to soar into the heavens. The butterfly that we love. So beautiful. It was once an ugly little worm munching on old leaves which it built into a tomb for itself. The butterfly comes from a tomb. It was an earthworm. Couldn't get off the dust. Couldn't leave the dirt. And now it soars in the heavens. Every month the moon dies and is born again as in resurrection. Every 24 hours, the sun goes down, there's darkness, symbol of death. Then in the morning, resurrection. You and I, every day of our lives, have acted out the resurrection without thinking about it. So let me come into your bedroom. You've been there as though dead, not doing anything, not getting into any mischief, Not feasting, not watching TV, not writing letters. Just lying there, still. Someone who didn't understand about sleep might say, they're dead. And you look out the window and it's all dark, no light. But as you still watch, and the morning comes, the sun rises, the light floods into the room, that apparent corpse stirs. Oh! shakes itself, gets up, it's conscious again. That's resurrection, my friends. We act it out every day of our life. But now I need to stress this fact. (coughs) There can be no resurrection without atonement. No resurrection without atonement. Immortality would be a bitter thing, a sour thing, if we were still sinful. We would turn heaven into hell. There can be no resurrection without atonement. It's not by chance that the scripture links together the life, death and resurrection of our Lord. Look with me at the last verse of Romans 4. A verse, again, that's often neglected, but full of importance. The last verse of Romans 4. He was delivered over to death 
for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Keep your finger there and turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and look at, I think it's verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. If Christ has not risen from the dead, you and I are still guilty, heading for judgment day and eternal death. Have you got that? Read it again. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Now go back to Romans 4. He was delivered over to death for our sins. He was raised to life for our justification. That's wonderful news. We all have sins. We've all done things we regret. No exceptions. But he took our sins. All our sins. Yesterdays, todays and tomorrows. When we hear the good news, we hate sin, but we still make mistakes. But Calvary covered it all. He was delivered over for our sins. And so the good news now, of course, <coughs> is that you don't have to be good to be saved. You do have to be saved to be good. The good news is we come just as we are. His last companion on earth is a terrorist, a murderer, a thief. And Christ forgives his sins and says we're going to be, be in company together in paradise. He takes the place of another terrorist, Barabbas. As I told you, I think last time I spoke, Barabbas could have said, can't be true, an innocent man taking my place? You're pulling my leg. Stop joking. I know you're going to hang me, crucify me. Anyway, I'm going to stay here till I'm a better man. Barabbas is you. Barabbas is me. He, the innocent, took the place of the guilty. He was delivered over for our sins. He took all our sins and raised again for our justification. Christ's resurrection was the seal on the atonement, the evidence that all the guilt of the world had been hurled into Joseph's new tomb, gone forever. And so you and I can stand before him spotless in his imputed righteousness. No condemnation, now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my Lord. Amazing love. How can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me? Can it be that I can claim an interest in my Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused him pain, for me who him to death pursued? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. For God so loved the world. Is that where you live? He died for you. That whosoever believeth, what's your name? Are you a whosoever? If you believe, you will not perish. You'll have everlasting life. We're all dying people here. All of us have quite a bit wrong with us, physically, mentally and spiritually. We're all dying, but if we're in Christ, God views us as spotless as his own son. And what's more, we have heaven now if we believe truly. Where did you get that from, Des? John 5, 24. He that believeth will have, no, he that believeth has everlasting life. You've got it now. You've got it now. Heaven is ours now, two things will make that real to you. <coughs> One is the practice of gratitude. If you say a person is an ungrateful person, you couldn't say anything worse about them. But how grateful are we? Do you know a third of Australians, adult Australians, suffer from either continual pain or recurring chronic pain. And a half to two thirds of these people spend days or months 
away from work. Pain causes the loss of more days of activity than cancer or heart disease. If you are not in pain today, how grateful you should be. If you can't sleep at night, thank God if you're not in pain. Thank God for food. Haven't you marvelled at the wonders of the architecture of fruit? The beautiful things that God has made? Wonderfully made, all tokens of his love. He loves us. No use whatever unless he'd given us a sense of taste. If they all tasted like sawdust, no thanks to you, God. But he made them taste good and he gave us a sense of taste. What a wonderful combination. He's made things beautiful, no good whatever, unless he gave us eyes to discern beauty. It could have all been grey. Or he could have made the sky black all the time and the grass red all the time. Great gratitude. Gratitude is the spice and the oil of the Christian life. It's the spice that enlivens us. It's the oil that smooths life. Matthew 11, when our Lord condemned the cities that wouldn't hear him. The next thing we read, and Jesus looks up to heavenward and says, I thank thee, God. I thank thee. You've hid these things from the wise and prudent, revealed them unto babes. And when he's about to die, about to hang on a cross, about to be cut, side, hands and feet, he takes bread and what? Gave thanks for it. Albert Schweitzer, who spent over 40 years at Lamborghini, heathen Africa, said the secret of life is to learn to give thanks for everything. Hey, Albert, that's a bit much. Well, he's only quoting the epistles. Repeatedly, the epistles, whether it's Philippians or Thessalonians, say in everything, give thanks. I can remember <coughs> over 60 years ago, I was called back to Avondale with finished a degree, there were no degrees when I graduated at the end of the 40s <coughs> and I had a very heavy program, they expected me to do a lot of academic work and I was also teaching and I was also preaching on Sabbath and uh, my habit was to begin very early in the morning, hours before sun up, but I began to have weak, dizzy spells and I thought here I've got a year ahead of me then I'm to go over to America to get a couple of degrees, then I'm to come back to head up the Bible department, and here I am still a kid and I'm having dizzy spells. That's no good. So I decided I would begin to jog. And jogging is not for everybody. If you walk much, that's fine. But I felt I needed to jog to try and offset this physical disability. So the first day I jogged for a minute and I was had it. After a week I could jog for five minutes and after a few weeks I could jog for 40 minutes and I kept that up for 50 years until I had knee trouble. Now the fact is I realise I would have been dead years ago but for those dizzy spells. It takes a true sense of gratitude to believe that all things work together for good to them that love God. I was only a very young Christian when someone says, There's a, we wish you'd reply to this letter in the paper. Give a Christian reply. And I didn't know how busy I thought I was. So moaning and groaning to myself, I write a reply and send it to the newspaper and they publish it and send me a few, do, few no, they were pounds in those days. And I say, here's a wonderful thing. I've been complaining and grumbling about doing an obvious Christian duty and I get paid for it. But that's the way God works. In everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. When I was at Coffs Harbour, this is the early 1950s, I used to drive to some distant parts of New South Wales 
to take meetings in homes, etc. And my mother was staying with me at the time and she usually liked to go with me wherever I went. On this particular day, she said, I'm not going to come with you today. Three hours later, I'm coming down a very strange sort of hill with gullies. The cattle had been over and made it all sticky and messy. And then suddenly the wheel is turned out of my hands and I go over the edge and a watcher says, your car turned over three times. I just remember saying to myself, try and relax and you won't break too many bones. I was in an old tourer and the head was taken off. The, uh, the top of the thing was swept away and all dazed, I get out in the muddy bottom and sit on a battery which shows how stupid you can be. <laughs> I sat on the battery that had been dislodged. But as I went through it a hundred times that night after taking a Bible study at the home where I stayed, I suddenly thought, if my mother had come with me that day, I'd be dead now because I couldn't have lain down on the seat. There'd have been no room. I'd have been dead. It'd be a wonderful thing if you and I could learn gratitude, to believe what Schweitzer says, to learn to be grateful for everything. That will be a spice. That will be an oil for our lives. The other thing is faith. Gratitude for the things we see, many of which we don't want to see. Thank God for the ugly things. Faith is for what we can't see. God, you've promised this and that. I can't see it. We started these meetings with two or three people. If God wills, it will continue to grow. When my daughter expressed all her ambitions for what we're trying to do here, my faithless heart said, would it could be so? Would it could be so? So faith is for what we can't see particularly when the going's tough. Faith says, my Lord wore my crown of thorns for me. Why should I wear it too? Now please get this point. It'll sweeten the rest of your days and mine if I can remember it. I pray many times a day, Lord, help me to live the way I preach wherever my preaching's right. <laughs> so let me say this to you. Don't wear a crown of thorns. Worry, anxiety, hatred, lust, impurity, covetousness, discontent. Don't wear a crown of thorns because our Lord wore the crown of thorns for us. He took our griefs, carried our sorrows, that our crown might be a crown of tender mercies and loving kindness, that we might be happy children, Fulfilling the commandment, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Hey, I've broken that commandment more times than I could count if I had a Methuselah's life to count. I was very encouraged when I read that Billy Graham sometimes bit his fingernails. Oh, I thought there's hope for me yet. <laughs> We're not to wear a crown of thorns that we make for ourselves. All of us make for ourselves burdens that a Heavenly Father never designed we should bear. All negative thoughts are in that category. They are burdens our Heavenly Father never intended we should bear. He wore the crown for us. Des, are you trying to tell me if I've got enough faith, everything's going to be hunky-dory, it's going to be wonderful? Yes, I am. If our faith were but more simple, we would take him at his word and our lives would be all sunshine in the radiance of his word. Hey, it's not possible. Life is full of tragedy, disappointment, pain. You're talking rubbish. Listen, if you face the sun, what happens to the shadows? They all fall behind you. Isn't this why the New Testament is full of admonitions? Looking unto Jesus, consider him. They saw no man but Jesus only. If we were looked at the incarnate son, 
not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N, then the shadows will fall behind us. This is the fight of faith. This is the battle of the Christian life. To endure like Moses, seeing him who's invisible. I challenge you, but I challenge myself because I have many failures. And so heaven begins here. He that believeth has everlasting life. But it becomes real to us when we practice gratitude for everything and we learn to trust him for everything. Then heaven becomes real to us. So we can say, Yea, although I walk through the shadow, death is no more than the cloud over the sun. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. You and I ought to say that many times a day. Doesn't matter what the doctor says. Doesn't matter what the banker says. Doesn't matter what the pastor says. Doesn't matter what the preacher says. Many times a day we should say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me today and forever. We're going to have prayer and remember <coughs> people who've written in requests. God knows everything you've written. We're going to pray for all those requests in one. Let's bow our heads. Thank you for the gospel. It makes the invisible visible. It makes pain flee and sorrow rush away. It causes love to be born in our hearts and with it gratitude and faith. We pray for all the requests that people have written today and given to us for prayer. You know them all, Lord. We commit them to you. We know you answer every prayer, but sometimes you answer no because that's the best answer. And very often you answer, wait a while, but you answer every prayer. So we commit all these prayers to you and we commit ourselves to you. Please put it into our hearts to make this little atom of the church useful for you in Brisbane. Put it into our hearts to bring people to hear the gospel that your name may be glorified in this place. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Amen.